As we come together on a Sunday service, we come together as a group of believers. So around you will be, most of the people will be, but people who believe in Jesus. We come to be in God's presence together. We come to give God praise. And we come to receive from God the rejuvenation of our souls, our spirits and our bodies that he wants for us. It's our role as a worship team to help you move into the presence of God to be, invite the spirit to be amongst us and to help you enter into praise and worship. It's the whole role of our preacher Helen, who's down over there. Helen, welcome. To bring the teaching from God's word to us. It's the role of children's ministries to bless the children with understanding of who God is and to minister to their souls. And it's our role as a congregation to put aside for this moment the worries of the past, the anxieties that we have about the future, and to bask in the presence of God and to receive what he wants for us. Lord, be amongst us this morning, we pray. We invite you to be here amongst us. We crave that you're here amongst us, for that's why we come. Thank you, Lord. So Helen's going to bring to us a sermon from Mark 11, which talks about, one of the portions of that is talking about the triumphal entry into Jerusalem of Jesus. And it's interesting because it's a bit of pathos in there. It's triumphal on one hand, but it's actually leading to something quite ter terrible on the other. And then it leads from there into something that's quite victorious. He came humbly. Instead of like the Romans who were gold chariots and white horses and fanfares and flags and all sorts of things, he just got on a humble colt and walked quietly into Jerusalem. And yet the people received him with amazing joy. He came with, his, with God's purpose in his heart. He knew what was going to happen. In fact, he had said it in the previous chapter, that he was going to come in. The disciples said, oh, and the people around him said, if you do that, you're going to get killed. Jesus put his head down and came to do what his master had asked him to do. He came aware of that sacrifice that he was going to make in three days' time. He came allowing the people to celebrate, but knowing that their understanding of what was going on was faulty. Because they thought he was coming as a conquering king. We know now, looking back, that he came to conquer um, us and to conquer our lives and conquer the situations we find ourselves in. But he also came knowing that he was going to create a great victory the victory that our souls benefit from now. So let's stand and sing one of the songs that comes from that passage of scripture. Now, some of you have had coffee, all right? So those with coffee are going to do what I'm going to do, all right? Because you've got the stimulus going on inside of you, okay? So we're going to sing that old song, the Hosanna, Hosanna. Glory in the highest. So... And I'm going to walk around um, the thing and we can all like, make a big procession and around. And so stand up with me. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Come through. Hosanna, come along Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Could we lift up your name? of praise be exalted O Lord our God Hosanna in the highest Hosanna glory glory to the King of Kings glory 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 to the King of Kings Lift up your name with a heart full of praise. Be exalted, O Lord our God. Hosanna to the King of Kings. 
Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Lord, we lift up your name. Okay, give yourselves a hand. Thanks, everybody. And we carry on with this idea that he's the King of Kings. And we're going to crown our Lord with, crown him with many thrones. Thank you, Heather, if you can start this off for us. I got it wrong last time. I just started straight away, but she's going to do the intro. <laughs> Hang on, now, now let's we'll get this right, all right? So we, we said as a group that we're going to do a little interlude in here and we forgot then, so we're going to do it, all right? So here we go, introduction again. Here we go, verse 2. Crown him the Lord of life who triumphed all the grave and rose victorious in the strife for those he came to save who now reach now we see who died and rose on high who died eternal life to bring that Lord In what's above, crown him the king to whom is given the wondrous gift of love. All hail, Redeemer, hail, for thou hast died for me. Thy praise shall never, never fail through all eternity. Father God, we stand in front of you and thank you for who you are. We crown you king, and yet we also see you as the lamb upon the throne. Our songs, the heavenly anthems, the, the angels, and our worship. May they all be bl um, a blessing to you, Lord, and may you receive our praise. Thank you, Father, for being here amongst us. Please be seated. Um, he honore, he ke te atua. Honour and glory to God. Um, Ko Helen Tuku Ingwa, um, as I've been introduced, my name is Helen, um, and I am a Kiri student at the moment, but um, I actually fuck up back here um, in the, I used to be one of the youth back in the day, um, and by the day, probably like 
five, six years ago. Um, <laughs> I grew up um, in Manurewa, moved to, to Whangarei, um, and I started coming to City Youth in year nine. And then this church became my, my sending church to Kerry Baptist Bible College. Um, so I will know some of you, I see a lot of familiar faces today, um, but there are a lot that uh, I, I don't know. Um, so kia ora, hello. Uh, <laughs> and this morning, Russell has given me, the Kerry student, um, the, the lovely passage of, of Mark 11, so there's one on there, but it's meant to be 11, 1 to 26, on the judgment of the tempo. Yeah, because the theology students get all the good ones. <laughs> um, <laughs> so this, this passage that I've been given today is, is quite a long one. Um, there's about five narrative parts or four narrative parts that, that make up um, Mark 1 to, to 26. Um, and as Rob introduced this morning the, the scripture of Jesus' triumphant um, entry in the Hosanna, um, he was on his way to Jerusalem. And that's where we start to this morning. Let's uh, read some scripture and I'm going to use my clicky thing. The last one, I forgot that I had this. Um, and so Ethan at the back there was moving them through and I was a bit like, oh, that's right, I can do this. <laughs> um, so let's, let's read together. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples ahead of him, saying to them, go to the village ahead of you, and just as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden before. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying this colt? Tell them, the Lord needs it, and will send it back here shortly. So they went and found a colt outside the street, tied at a doorway. As they untied it, people were standing there asked, what are you doing untying that colt? And so they answered, just as Jesus had told them to. And the people let them go. When they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, while others spread branches they had cut from the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. Then Jesus entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. He looked around at everything. But since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. I know many of you will um, have heard this, this passage before. It's, it's the famous Palm Sunday Easter story celebration. Jesus is coming back to Jerusalem. The Messiah is walking in to his, to his Jerusalem, to his temple. Glory and triumph surrounds him. The people of Israel are like, we have our Messiah, he's coming back, he's coming to Jerusalem, and he is gonna come and win this all for us. We are so ready to be saved by our oppressors, the Roman. We are so ready to be brought back to the glory and be exalted as the holy nation of God again. Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest, save now. They're literally waiting forever for this. And so Jesus comes in on his, on his cult. But what does he do? What does this triumphant entry end in? Jesus walking into the temple, <laughs> looking around and then going home because it was a bit late. <laughs> Whew, talk about anticlimactic, right? Is this, this going on? Yes, Jesus. Jerusalem. And then, oh, flat like a pancake. He just goes home because it's late. <laughs> um, <laughs> 
some of my notes are a little bit messed up from this morning. But um, so far, let me just get my stuff together here. <laughs> I think it's flipped around the wrong way. This might allude to us, however, this, this, this climactic entry and then anticlimactic drop, that this isn't actually the focal point, the highest point of the story. Mark alludes to us all, he supposedly says, and throughout the, his words, that there's something more coming, and it has to do with food. <laughs> Yay. Um, so let's read from 12 to 14. In the morning, as they went along, they saw the fig tree withered from the roots. Peter remembered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, look, the fig tree, oh my goodness, I'm reading from the wrong part. Bit of a bit of a head. Let's, let's redo. Beep. <laughs> the next day they were leaving at Bethany. Jesus was hungry. Seeing in the distance a fig tree and leaf, he went to find out if it had any fruit. When he reached it, he found nothing but leaves because it wasn't the season for figs. Then he said to the tree, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And the disciples heard him say this. First impressions on this story? This kind of got me wondering if Jesus was a little bit hangry. You know, maybe he was in need of a bit of a Snickers bar. You know, you're not you and you're hungry, Jesus. <laughs> what, why was he cursing? A fig tree that wasn't even in season. It's a bit rash, isn't it? Maybe Mark is alluding that there's something extra here for us to see. Because what purpose would a story of hangry Jesus have in the narrative at hand? <laughs> a closer look into the text and to what the first hearers and readers of this passage would notice is that the significance of the fig tree in this story is actually the big deal. The fig tree that is used in, is used in, rab in rabbinic imagery to symbolize Israel. The Jews considered it to be the most fruitful tree. If you don't know what a, a fruitful or a very leafy fig tree looks like, it looks like this. I didn't know what a fig tree looked like um, until a couple of days ago. <laughs> But this, this tree is, is held in such high esteem in Israel. Its fruits are, of, are to be of the first fruits in the festival, the annual festival of the first fruits. They are to be brought to Jerusalem as a sacrifice, a giving an offering to the Lord. A good fig symbolized a godly woman or man, and the good fig tree symbolized God's righteous people, Israel. Therefore, Jesus landing no figs on the fig tree expands the meaning of this passage into so much more than just hangry Jesus. But metaphorically, he is speaking to Israel. He is cursing the fruitlessness of Israel. It offered the illusion of fruit, but had none. You kind of see here, Jesus. It looks like he's kindly talking to the tree, but um, in the movie, he's, he's quite, quite not. <laughs> um, so considering what's happened and what ha was going to happen for the rest of the day, they were on their way back to Jerusalem. There might be a hint of drama coming, if you know what I mean. Shall we read on? Because the story is going to get quite juicy. On reaching Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple courts and began driving out those who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves and would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. And as he taught them, he said, Is it not written that my house is to be called a house of prayer for all nations? 
but you have made it into a den of robbers. The chief priests, priests and the teachers of the law heard this and began looking for a way to kill him, for they feared him, because the whole crowd was amazed at his teaching. When evening came, Jesus and his disciples went out to the city, out of the city. If we keep the previous passage in mind about Jesus cursing the fig tree, a symbol for the temple, and now this outburst of anger in the temple, we might conclude that Jesus seems to be quite upset by something in the Jerusalem temple. Often in past teachings and sermons that I've heard on this passage before, I have been led to the conclusion that Jesus was really, really mad that the temple had been turned into a place of commerce and trading, not just a place for prayer. However, a deeper understanding of Jesus' context at hand dispels this conclusion for me. In our society today, the secular and the sacred, church and state, are often, they often stand far apart, but not in Jesus' day. In fact, commercial activity was an entirely normal aspect of the temple. The Jerusalem temple was, at the very time Jesus was a boy coming to it, until his adulthood, an economic institution that dominated Jerusalem's city's commercial life. It was a place of prayer and atonement, but it was also a place of employment for various artisans, like curtain makers, barbers, incense makers, goldsmiths. It was a convenient place for doves, sacrificial um, elements such as olives and, um, oh, what is something else? Olives, first fruits, all of that, animals, for the weary traveller coming from all around Jewish dysphoria. <laughs> like I said, sorry, my things are a little bit, a bit tired. The majority of economic life in the temple was also governed by the chief priests and the rabbis. They cared about it. They often cared about what was happening in their temple courts. In fact, trading in the temple wasn't, so trading in the temple wasn't what Jesus got angry about. If we look into what Mark describes Jesus directs his action towards, we'll find that it was less about the trading and more about how they were trading. First, Jesus, after ceasing the traders and sellers, he went to the money changers, overturning their tables. Jerusalem was a hub for Jewish travelers, for God-fearers, for just normal travelers coming to the city. It was a humming city of people. Various people from various places would bring the money that they had with them. And they would exchange it for temple coin. The money changers were therefore street level bankers, representing the banks in the interests of the oppressive financial institutions that kept the poor poor and the rich rich, using unfair exchange rates. The doves, the dove sellers, well, they represented, well, they were actually a very important um, staple temple sacrifice for, for the poor, for the woman and for the unclean. They represented people oppressing and leaving the poor poorer than they came into the sanctuary for. I wonder what the price for a dove was um, in Simon, who was Paul the Apostle's pre um, rabbi. There's a story of him coming into the temple 
and he noticed that the doves were being sold for two gold dinars. Two gold dinars. <laughs> two gold dinars wasn't something that the poor, the orphaned, the widowed, the unclean leper coming in to the temple could afford. It was the lowest, most possible thing that you could buy to sacrifice. So Simon came in and he's like, this is enough. This is totally enough. And he stood just like Jesus did in the, in the temple. And he was like, this isn't cool, guys. Let's get this price down. Let's get this down to one, at least one gold dinar. But that day, the Sadducees, the chief priests, they decided that actually, yeah, Simon's got a point. Let's make this cheaper for our poor. And they got it down to one silver dinar. How awesome is that? But sadly, this is a story that happened after Jesus was at the temple, which leads us to think, what was the price for a dove? It is, isn't unknown that cultic obligations such as buying sacrifices, buying atonement um, items made in the temple were especially hard on the poor. They created a system that marginalised the poor, the woman, the leper. The quality of the sacrificial item wasn't the same as a goat, unblemished, or a lamb. It branded them as second-class citizens, robbing them so they would stay that way. Jesus wasn't mad at the trading in principle. He was mad at the injustice that it brought. So he goes on to teach all who will listen. He goes on to say, it is not written, my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. But you have made it a den of robbers. Jesus here draws his teaching from two different passages. From our Old Testament prophets. The first one is from Isaiah. Isaiah 6, 56, verse 7. These are things I will bring to my holy mountain and give them joy in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and sacrifices will be accepted on my altar. For my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. This is perhaps the fullest Old Testament vision of what an inclusive Israel was to look like. It narrates God's promise to the foreigner, to the Gentile, to the socially marginalised that they would be included and accepted into this house of prayer for all nations. And then in the second part, that you have made it a den of robbers, he draws from Jeremiah 7.11, a sermon Jeremiah gives to the temple in his time. A den is a place that a fox retreats to after pillaging through chicken coops, robbing from the farmers. It's a safe comfortable home. The sermon in Jeremiah 7 rebukes the people of Israel for oppressing the orphan, the widow, shedding innocent blood and idolatry. If you want to read the whole thing, it goes into all of that. And warns, but it also warns such people against treating the temple as a good luck charm that will preserve them against their enemies. Therefore, if Isaiah 56 tells us that the temple is falling short of, I, of the Isaiah's depiction of the blessed precinct of the blessed Israel in the last days, of the last days. Then Jeremiah 11, 7, 11 tells us that it is like the cursed temple of old, waiting for divine destruction at the hands of Israel's enemies. Israel was not on the verge of exaltation like it thought it was. Like when Jesus brought in his triumphant entry at the start, just the day before, Israel was actually in for another coming judgment. Shaken and stirred, and understandably so, 
the profiteers of this den, the chief priests and the teachers. Seeing Jesus has shown his hand, showed theirs. Jesus has spoken up against their, their den of robbers to which they plotted for his death. And then he returns home yet again. Some nice pictures. Oh no, he didn't, but he did. <laughs> so let's continue reading on in our last passage. This is the one that I was um, I mean, just uh, that I got mixed up before. <laughs> In the morning, as they went along, they saw the fig tree withered from the roots. Peter remembered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, look, the fig tree you cursed has withered. Have faith in God. Jesus answered, I tell you the truth. If anyone says to this mountain, go, throw yourself into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will happen, it will. It will be done for him. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. And when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive him so that your Father in heaven may forgive you. a nice ending kind of to the, to the drama that's happened in our scripture before. Have faith in God, Jesus answered. As we can see here for Peter has picked up that the tree that Jesus cursed earlier has withered. In this we can see another metaphorical expression of Jesus' judgment on the temple. It has withered to, in some places that talk about withered to its roots. But he moves on to give a sermon to Peter to the disciples that hear him. They have lost faith in their, their center of the worship. The temple of Jerusalem was said to be, um, was said to be Jesus, sorry, was said to be God's dwelling place among people. It was so important, so huge, and your, your prayers in the temple were meant to be heard. Um, more potently than in other places. That's why people today still go to the, to the wall, to the Wailing Wall in Jerusalem to pray because it's the closest place that they can get to God. But Jesus here is saying that a time of destruction is coming for the temple. But there's a new temple coming. There's a new way to pray. There's a new way to speak to God, and it isn't confined into a temple box. It's everywhere, it's in him. It's pretty exciting, but for the disciples, pretty life-changing. The center of their worship has been taken away from them. Interesting, right? Jesus assures his disciples in this passage that even with the impending destruction of the temple, that they will be heard and that they have a new place. And through him, their prayers will be heard. He gives his disciples a new center of faith as we see through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ to come. It's a picture of the withered tree.
For many of us here today, there isn't something in our lives as big as the temple. There isn't something as important as the temple was to the Israelites, a centre of who they were. But there are definitely structures, systems, institutions today that still exist that we hold sacred. To bridge Jesus' context to ours today would set a challenge for us all to identify and reflect on our religious and political and economical life. This text challenges us to re-examine the institutions we are a part of. The challenge is to take a good and critically minded look into our own esteemed fig trees and judge the fruit. Is it all for show? A tree with beautiful luscious leaves, a promise, juicy fruit. Or is it a tree that has no fruit? Actioning what would lead us to ask some critical questions. Questions that would say whether this tree is, is fruitful or not. What are the leaders like in this institution? What do they lead? What intent to further themselves and reputations do they have? Are they there to feather their own nests or to provide for others? to grow and nurture others out of a nest and into the world? Does this, do our institutions and systems and structures allow the temple, like the temple, a way for people to get away with ritual repentance that never affects their hearts and lives? Do these institutions work for the good of all or for the good of some? Today that gives us something to think about. Jesus' acts in the temple give us something to think about in our own systems and structures of today. I'm going to wrap up there. Um, and I'm just going to send a, a closing blessing for us all. Kia tō, kia tātou katoa. Te ātawhai o tō tātou araki, a ihu karaiti. Me te aroha, O te whiwhina tahitanga ki te wairua tapu. Ake, ake, ake. Amen. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ go with you, and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you for, forever and ever. Amen. <coughs>
shall return in robes of white the blazing sun shall pierce the night and I will rise among the saints my gaze transfixed on Jesus' face Holy, holy, holy. 